This episode of The Sweaty Penguin is brought to you by Toothpaste Tubes. Do you wish you could clean your teeth and harm the environment? Buy some Toothpaste Tubes today. Welcome to episode 42 of The Sweaty Penguin, Antarctica's hottest podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Brown. It is Friday, April 16th, and we are six days out from Earth Day. Super exciting. Happy Earth Day. Go do something sustainable or talk climate with a friend. Or hey, subscribe to the podcast, leave us a five-star rating and review, and hop on our Patreon. I certainly won't complain if that's how you want to celebrate. Joining the Patreon will get you some Sweaty Penguin swag, exclusive bonus content, and of course, a shout out at the end of the show. Because it's almost Earth Week, via our Peril and Promise partnership, the Sweaty Penguin is partnering in covering climate nows, living through the Climate Emergency Joint Coverage Week. As you know, we are committed to informing our audience about the realities of the climate crisis and its solutions, and we've got a really interesting and important climate story for you this week. Be sure to check out all the great environmental journalism this week at coveringclimatenow.org or under the hashtag ClimateEmergencyWeek on on social media. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from PBS flagship station, the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more about Peril and Promise at pbs.org slash peril and promise. Today, we are talking about toxic waste, a phrase that somehow simultaneously describes hazardous chemicals, X's, and every single piece from the board game Mousetrap. Seriously, you get the game as a Christmas present from someone who hates your family, you make your parents set it up for you, you play it one time, and it either breaks or it's so boring that you shove it in a closet for 10 years and never touch it again until you send it to a landfill with everybody else's Mousetrap boards. I mean, I don't want to say Mousetrap directly caused the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, but you do the math. But we're not talking about mouse trap today, we are talking about brownfields, pieces of land previously developed for commercial or industrial use that have been compromised by harmful substances. And as you can probably guess, for communities living near these toxic waste sites, there's quite a major risk. The muddy alphabet soup of carcinogens, a.k.a. the Baum Brook, meanders past the former Cornell Dubolier Electronics plant in South Plainfield. I'm sorry, did she just call a brook muddy alphabet soup? I can think of a lot of soups that look like hazardous wastewater, but alphabet soup is certainly not one of them. I could see a lobster bisque or a pea soup looking like contaminated water, or even a clam chowder if the toxins are chunkier for some reason. But unless there's a chemical I haven't heard of that looks like little letter-shaped noodles, alphabet soup is a terrible metaphor. The only alphabet soup that looks like toxic sludge is Chef Boyardee's mini ABCs and 123s with meatballs. And if you're referring to that, it would save a lot of confusion to just say the muddy Chef Boyardee's mini ABCs and 123s with meatballs of carcinogens, aka the Bound Brook, as opposed to dragging all of alphabet soup down with you. The U.S. General Accounting Office estimates that there are as many as 425 thousand brown fields in the United States. And regardless of whether or not it looks like alphabet soup, toxins from these sites do seep into nearby communities. And that's really concerning, because in the U.S., 143 million people live within three miles of a brown field. That's 43% of all Americans. And as climate change worsens, brown fields are hit by floods, by wildfires, by hurricanes, and by other extreme weather events that threaten to spread the toxins even further. So today, we'll discuss what threats brownfields pose to nearby communities, how climate change aggravates them, and what we might be able to do about it. But first, what exactly are brownfields? According to the EPA, a brownfield is a property whose expansion, redevelopment, or reuse may be complicated by the presence or potential presence of a hazardous substance, pollutant, or contaminant. These can range from small patches of land to massive tracts spanning hundreds of square miles. Brownfields arise in a number of ways. The most common form is a petroleum site, where petroleum is housed in underground storage tanks and is prone to leakage. They can also 
also be abandoned buildings, dry cleaning facilities, gas stations, railroad yards, commercial facilities, industrial sites, landfills, dump sites, mine scarred lands, schools, former healthcare facilities, and even formerly used defense sites, which are pieces of land used by the military. And I know what you're wondering is Area 51 a brownfield? And all I can say is that when I flew out and showed up at the gate to ask, they really quickly changed the subject. We had some tea and scones, and then I went on my merry way. Historically speaking, one of the most infamous brownfields was Love Canal. In 1892, railroad entrepreneur William T. Love proposed connecting the Upper and Lower Niagara River by digging a six to seven mile long canal, because apparently when people didn't have television for entertainment, they were so bored that their only options were going bowling, reading some Charles Dickens, or digging a six to seven mile long canal. But after a depression, Love abandoned his project, leaving behind a 3,000 foot by 60 foot hole in the ground. 50 years later, that hole was a chemical disposal site used by the U.S. Army, the city of Niagara, and most prominently, a company called Hooker Chemical, which answers the age-old question, what happens when you name your chemical company with a game of raunchy Mad Libs? By 1953, the canal consisted of around 21,000 tons of toxic chemicals, including at least 12 known carcinogens. Let me say that again. 21,000 tons. That's a quantity of chemicals equivalent to the weight of two Eiffel Towers, 5,200 elephants, or 133,000 Lou Ferrignos. So Hooker Chemical did what any of us would do, cover the canal in dirt and sell it to the Board of Education for one dollar. And I have to say, Board of Education, you couldn't negotiate that down more? I know a dollar sounds cheap, but think what else you could do with a dollar. You can get a scratch off, you can buy the game Heads Up, you can even go to a dollar store and buy a bottle of bubbles. Come on, tell me 21,000 tons of chemicals is more valuable than a bottle of bubbles. Yeah, that's what I thought. So now we fast forward to 1978, when there were approximately 800 private single-family homes and 240 low-income apartments built around the canal. Homeowners were never warned that their properties were located near a chemical waste dump and had no idea, until investigative journalists and grassroots door-to-door -door health surveys began revealing high rates of birth defects and miscarriages and illnesses, like epilepsy, asthma, migraines, and nephrosis in the neighborhood. And after after some wet winters raised the water table in the Love Canal neighborhood, the chemicals leached into the basements and yards of nearby residents and into the playground of the elementary school conveniently built directly over the canal. This led to two federal state of emergency declarations and ultimately the 1980 Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, more commonly known as the Superfund Law. The Superfund Law was designed to identify the most dangerous and hardest to reclaim brownfields, identify who is responsible for the pollution, and either mandate that they pay to clean the site, or in the case where the responsible party isn't clear, the government would pay to clean it. Originally, that was through a tax on oil and chemicals, but since 1995, it's been financed through the general fund to which all taxpayers contribute. And as great as that law sounds, it also ran into some roadblocks. Well, I think when Superfund was first enacted, we all thought that it was going to be a five-year program. EPA could go out and clean up these sites and we would be done. Um, we were all wrong. That's not what's happened. There are over 1,300 sites still on the National Party's list needing cleanup. That was Catherine Probst, an environmental policy analyst that consulted on the Superfund program in the 80s. And while I guess hindsight is 2020, I'm really surprised that she or anyone thought this issue would be fixed in only five years. First off, the first element of the program is identifying the brownfields, and we certainly hadn't identified them all by 1980. We haven't even found them all today. Second, the quality of a brownfield cleanup is quite subjective, so the idea that cleanups would wouldn't be followed by future research in the region and possible revisiting of a site is a little short-sighted. And third, we're talking about a government project here. If it takes the government eight hours just to call your name at the DMV, can you imagine how long it would take to clean every toxic waste site in the country? And beyond that, they plan to go after corporations to make them pay for it, which can lead to lengthy legal battles. Obviously, analysts like this one have since realized that five years was a bit of a pipe dream 
dream, but it's still really jarring that that was the original plan. So what does all of this mean for the environment? First off, it's pretty easy to see that a site leaching toxic chemicals isn't going to be great for surrounding communities. Research has shown higher levels of cancer, developmental disabilities, and other serious health issues in communities near brownfields and Superfund sites. Pregnant women living near an uncleaned Superfund site also have a 20 to 25 percent higher risk of having a child with congenital birth defects than those that live near a site that's been cleaned up. Children living near Superfund sites have seen higher rates of school suspensions and repeated grade levels, lower standardized test scores, and decreased cognitive functioning. And in the case of Love Island, the health impacts were so horrifying that they actually led to chromosomal damage. They took it to the Board of Health, and they were found that those people had chromosomal damage as a result of living there. And they, they were told, don't reproduce. I'm sorry, don't reproduce? What is this, 8th grade health class? Setting aside the fact that that's an absolutely horrible thing to tell people, especially when these people were not warned of the chemicals in the area and were certainly not responsible for it, I'd like to think someone at the Board of Health could have at least thought of a more subtle way to prevent people from reproducing. I don't know, make a law that all men must grow mutton chops, or run a promotion for zip-off pants, or tell everyone to start a podcast, anything other than saying don't reproduce produce. In addition to human health impacts, brownfields also impact surrounding ecosystems. Hazardous chemicals don't just impact people, but they impact any number of plants and animals. A study in Georgia, for example, collected tissue samples from birds in the area of the Linden Chemical Plant, a Superfund site containing the chemical Aurochlor 1268. The study found birds had ingested enough of the chemical to see lower egg production, physical and physiological abnormalities in offspring, and immune system disorders. Since birds are at the top of the food chain, they're a really good indicator of the overall health of an ecosystem, meaning they were likely just one of many categories of species facing impacts. And if all of that wasn't concerning enough, due to climate change, the impacts of brownfields and Superfund sites are about to get a lot worse. As we've covered before, climate change increases the frequency and severity of natural disasters, such as floods, wildfires, and hurricanes. Federal data suggests about 60% of Superfund sites are in areas that may be impacted by wildfires and flooding. When sites experience these disruptions, the chemicals can very easily leach and spread into the surrounding communities. These chemicals are sort of like those hard strawberry candies that show up around Christmas. No matter how much you hate that they exist, they'll still find a way to show up in every nook and cranny in your house. Seriously, who buys them? And how did that one get unwrapped and stuck onto the back of the couch cushion? And why is there a hair growing out of it? Now, all of that might sound like a theoretical future problem, but it isn't. Climate change is here now, and so is this. In 2017, for example, Hurricane Harvey ravaged the San Jacinto River waste pits near Houston, which led to the erosion of an armored cap that sealed off dioxins and other toxic substances. After the storm, officials found dioxin levels in the river sediment nearby was more than 2,000 times higher than what the EPA normally allows. In 2018, a wildfire overran the Iron Mountain Superfund site in Redding, California, which nearly destroyed the water treatment system at the mine and risked a massive poisonous explosion. And those are just two of many instances, and since most brownfields don't have the same recognition as these large Superfund sites, the issue is probably happening more than we know. In fact, the U.S. Government Accountability Office recommended that the EPA start clarifying the boundaries of brownfields, stating how its actions to protect surrounding communities from this climate-induced toxic mobility align with the agency's objectives, integrating information on climate change into risk assessments, and integrating information on climate change into risk responses. And currently, the EPA has only agreed to clarify boundaries. That's a little weird to me, because stating how action aligns with the agency's objectives sounds pretty easy. I don't know if the Government Accountability Office accepts a quick paragraph, but if they do, the EPA could knock out a second recommendation within the hour. You can even call me up. I'd gladly do it for a Chili's gift card.
So with horrific health and ecosystem impacts all aggravated by climate change, that begs the question, who lives near these brownfields? As it turns out, communities near brownfields are disproportionately minority, disproportionately below the poverty line, disproportionately people with less than a high school education, and disproportionately linguistically isolated, meaning everyone in the house over the age of 14 speaks a language other than English and doesn't speak English well. If you compare the demographics of all communities within a half mile of Superfund sites to the U.S. overall population, we see that communities near Superfund sites are 55% minority as compared to 40% overall, 22% below the poverty line as compared to 14% overall, 18% less than a high school education compared to 13% overall, and 7% linguistically isolated compared to 5% overall. These numbers are one of the big reasons why, over the last few decades, environmental justice has become a concern. With climate change, these injustices become even scarier. Just listen to Brian Padras, a Sierra Club organizer in Texas, share his experience with Hurricane Harvey. Judith Nieto's grandmother lives here, and during the storm, I was getting messages from her aunt because they were really concerned about the Crosby plant and how that might affect, you know, things here. Um, and of course, they were having to deal with the toxic fumes as well. So I promised I would bring them some, some masks. And I have to say, it's always really jarring to hear people talk about masks pre-COVID. It's sort of like watching video chatting in 2001 A Space Odyssey long before Skype or FaceTime or Zoom existed. It's like, wow, they knew what that was then? So cute to see them thinking it's helpful and not, you know, a constant nuisance you have to use every hour of every day. Such simpler times. But setting that aside, think about the fact that people in this predominantly low-income and minority community getting hit by Hurricane Harvey had to A, worry about the fumes from the Crosby plant on top of every other consequence of the storm, and B, had no solution outside of getting masks from their friend at the Sierra Club. That's horrifying. I'm sure you've heard a lot before about how climate change disproportionately impacts marginalized communities, but this is actually a step beyond that, because not only do they face more damage and slower recoveries from hurricanes, but they also have to contend with the disproportionate number of brownfields in their communities spreading toxins and harming health. Of course, all of this leads to a slew of economic costs, too. Harm to public health leads to health care costs, and the cognitive impact seen in children can eventually lead to lower economic productivity, a concept we've discussed in episodes like Mercury and ADHD. Brownfields also reduce property values in the surrounding area. But perhaps the most obvious economic cost is what we would call the opportunity cost. Opportunity cost describes the loss of potential gain from other alternatives when one alternative is chosen. For example, if a farmer chooses to plant corn, the farmer's opportunity cost would be whatever other use of the land would bring the most benefit, whatever that may be, growing soybeans, raising cattle, building a target, etc. If you choose to take the train to work instead of driving, and the train takes 30 minutes longer, your opportunity cost would be those 30 minutes which you could have spent doing something else. These examples might seem like they don't matter too much, but opportunity cost is actually really important, and brownfields are a perfect illustration of why. If you leave a brownfield alone, you not only bear all the costs we just discussed, but you also bear the opportunity cost of cleaning it up. Because if you clean up the brownfield, you're looking at more development on the land, more jobs on the land, and nearby property value increases of 5-15%. to 15%. Of course, it also costs money to clean the brownfield, but a 2008 analysis found that $1.3 billion invested through the EPA Brownfields Program led to 48,238 permanent jobs and $11.3 billion in new investments. And beyond that, a 2017 study found that redeveloping brownfields actually led the region to produce two to seven times more tax revenue than the initial government investment. 
So while these opportunity costs might not be visible to us just looking at the site in a vacuum, when we consider the alternatives that these tracts of lands can provide, we see that brownfields are actually costing a massive amount of money, jobs, and tax revenue. So where do we go from here? Well, as long as these sites aren't cleaned, these problems will still occur. So it's pretty clear that cleaning and remediating brownfields and Superfund sites is the logical fix. But the actual act of cleaning sites brings a lot of different options. One option is excavation, where contaminants and soil are dug up from the site and transported off-site for treatment or disposal, and clean soil is brought in to refill the excavated area. Another option is capping, where a barrier like a geotextile or a layer of clean soil is added on top of the brownfield. I know capping sounds less appealing than excavation on the surface since the chemicals are still there, but excavation can actually lead to chemical spreading since you're disrupting the land, and in many cases it's safer to seal the chemicals in than to rip them out. It's sort of like when you find a hornet's nest in your yard. It's safer to slap a sign on the tree saying do not not touch climb or build a treehouse than it is to rip out the hornet's nest with a baseball bat. There are also strategies like bioremediation or phytoremediation, where microbes or plants can take up the contaminants over a longer period of time and eventually restore the land. This process takes a lot longer than excavation and capping, but has the potential to bring the pros of both, no toxins and no spread. What about on the policy side? Well, given that Superfund sites are named after the Superfund law, it's pretty clear that there are already a lot of policy measures in place. In addition to the Superfund law, there's also the EPA Brownfields Grant, which provides funding for communities and states to prevent, assess, clean, and safely reuse brownfields. And as you can tell from this EPA video, they're really optimistic about the grant's potential. The EPA grant, Brownfields Grant was instrumental in helping in a couple of ways. One, uh, inspiring investor confidence to look at this area and creating a vision that those developers could rally around. And then uh, doing the, the fundamental work of the cleanup. And in theory, the Brownfields Grant sounds great. It's resulted in about 170,000 jobs nationwide and an average of approximately $20 leveraged for each dollar spent. However, while the EPA can certainly point to success stories as they do in that video, there are certainly concerns about the degree to which the Brownfields grant has helped. First off, we can see times in which either the EPA budget is cut or state budgets are cut and brownfield projects fall by the wayside. We can also see that there hasn't been anywhere near enough funding to clean every brownfield and certainly not enough to eradicate the injustice of brownfields disproportionately appearing in marginalized communities. Obviously, it's impossible to clean every brownfield in five years, but seeing the fact that over 425,000 brownfields still exist, it's hard to say the brownfield grant has been a complete success as it stands right now. But brownfields also don't have to be cleaned with government money. There's plenty of other ways, too. Many Superfund sites, for example, end up having to be cleaned by the polluter. That's always a tricky process, and it certainly takes a lot of time and government resources to determine the responsible party and get them to pay, which can require going through court. So unless Judge Judy has some time or we can get Chrissy Teigen court back, it's worth considering the cons of cleanups taking longer and requiring a lot of effort to get the polluter to pay, with the pro of actually having that fair outcome. There could also be more market incentives to promote brownfield cleanups in the free market. Right now, there is actually a brownfield expensing tax incentive, where landowners can get tax breaks in exchange for cleaning brownfields. Of course, the downside with relying on tax breaks is that they won't guarantee people take on the effort of cleaning brownfields. It won't even guarantee people know about the tax breaks, unless of course the IRS starts listing brownfield expensing at the top of every form in bold comic sans. However, it could be worth considering spreading awareness, increasing those tax breaks, or finding more incentives to do these cleanups. Given the economic benefit that comes from remediating this land, using market mechanisms to reflect those benefits more clearly for landowners could be an interesting option. And look, I get that when there's thousands of Superfund sites and hundreds of thousands of brownfields, it's really daunting to think about cleaning them all up. 
There's clear economic, social, environmental, and health impacts of doing so, but it still costs a lot of money and requires a lot of labor. But if we can clean them up, we'll curb a consequence of climate change, improve a horrific social injustice, help public health, and ensure no one has to live next to a brook where the water looks like Chef Boyardee's mini ABCs and 123s with meatballs. Do you wish you could store your toothpaste in a single-use container that takes hundreds of years to decompose and ends up in oceans harming wildlife and marine ecosystems? If so, toothpaste tubes are for you. Instead of buying one of the many non-plastic toothpaste options on the market, you could just as easily get a tube that's made from sheets of plastic with aluminum layering and send it to a landfill. Cool! Toothpaste tubes, the only container that comes in its own individual tiny cardboard box. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from PBS flagship station the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Welcome back to The Sweaty Penguin. With me today is Dr. Lemire Tehran, an assistant professor of environmental studies at SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Dr. Tehran, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Ethan. So you've covered a wide range of topics in your research exploring environmental justice and climate justice in a few different ways. So to start, one of the recent papers you co-authored was on the idea of a toxic mobility inventory. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what that means and how that can be useful. Yeah, well, if you think about extreme weather, particularly in coastal Atlantic states, Gulf Coast, um, really globally, if you think about the events of extreme weather and climate change phenomena, such as superstorms, sea level rise, these are going to be events, and they already have been events that have really uh, mobilized really uh, harmful threats in our environments. And when I'm talking about threats in our environments, I'm thinking about things like legacy pollution, like I said, Think about your national priority list sites, many of which, hundreds of which are in flood prone areas and also brownfields, concentrated animal feeding operations. There's a lot of variation. Some have to do with low lying areas. Think about a relatively flat state, relatively low lying state like Florida. So that's going to be part of the equation. Others have to do with the mere proliferation of hazardous sites. You can think about a state like North Carolina, which has thousands of concentrated animal feeding operations. But then you also have to be cognizant of the individual chemistries of specific sites. So not every heavy metal is going to be mobilized the same. So there are a variety of factors. And that's why what we did was we developed an inventory or a template for stakeholders to think about these uh, in very complex ways. And the study also looked at variables of race and income as they pertain to people's proximity to brownfields and Superfund sites. And seeing the risk associated with living near these sites, it's really concerning that low-income and minority communities are disproportionately exposed to these hazards. So why are these sites disproportionately exposed? Why did the sites end up in these communities? I think you're asking a really important question. So this is environmental justice 101. When you think about locally unwanted land uses and the race to the bottom. Oftentimes communities of color, particularly uh, black folks, also low income Americans, locally unwanted land uses oftentimes are cited in these communities. So we have to be very cognizant when we're thinking about enforcement of environmental laws, when thinking about protections, who's going to be most vulnerable to the mobilization of hazardous threats. Well, it's gonna be people who live in communities where these threats reside. And whether we're talking about, as I said before, CAFOs, you can think about the whole slew of human health consequences that have been associated uh, with these facilities. You can think about brownfields. There are so many brownfields in our society, we don't even know how many there are, but we do know that these things are disproportionately in communities of color. So we always must be mindful of if Black folks, Native communities have heightened proximity to these things, then how are we going to engage in activity to make sure that those communities aren't going to suffer the harm, the double harm, A, harm from climate change, but B, the threats that are being exposed from dangerous facilities. And there's kind of two issues within that, because there's the issue of 
hazardous facilities, whether it be coal plants, natural gas plants, petrochemicals being disproportionately in these communities. Then there's also the issue of which sites are getting cleaned up and which sites aren't getting cleaned up. Do you think that it's a mix of both issues contributing here? Do you think one or the other is a larger factor in this disproportionate exposure? Yeah, absolutely. When you think about the, let's just talk about Superfund sites or national priority list sites for a second. When you think historically how sites have been prioritized in terms of cleanup, sites that are in majority white neighborhoods, these sites not only historically have been cleaned up faster, but the level of remediation goes a lot deeper in these communities. So what does that tell us? You're in a black community, Latino, Latina community, not only is enforcement not going to be as consequential in your community historically, but the level of enforcement isn't going to go as deep. So that's certainly a factor. And there are other things as well. When you think about enforcement, you have to address a legacy of communication, environmental communication, a legacy of mistrust that oftentimes is pervasive due to historic inequality in relation to environmental enforcement. So I think that both of those things have to factor in into how we move forward to remediate these problems. And this issue of toxic mobility has certainly become a lot more real in recent years as hurricane seasons have gotten worse, Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Florence, etc. Could you speak a bit to how communities like these have been specifically impacted by toxic mobility as these events have increased? Absolutely. So in addition, and we don't even have to, before we look at the scale of hurricanes, you can think about the number one of the most numerable type of natural disaster. And we'll put natural disasters in quotations because there's certainly a human hand, a human element. But think about something like flooding, which is the most abundant type of natural disaster. And that is in terms of the proliferation, that's in terms of death toll. So if we think about that for a second, Certainly analysis has shown that even basic flooding events has uh, not just shown the potential, but has actually spread toxic material, harmful materials, things that range from animal feeding operations, materials that are in your basement or materials that are in your garage. These events have shown a long history of mobilizing toxic threats. And unfortunately, a lot of times critical facilities And when I'm talking about critical facilities, we're thinking about things like hospitals, schools, playgrounds, critical facilities have shown to have been in the pathway of this proliferation of mobilization. That calculus remains true for superstorms. And we think about vulnerability to superstorms and hurricanes. Who are your most vulnerable Americans? Who are your most vulnerable people globally? Typically, it's going to be marginalized racial communities. Typically, it's going to be marginalized, low-income communities. These are households and communities. Many times there may be transportation limitations, which pose difficulties, which disallow folks to evacuate. There may be other reasons why people can't evacuate. A lot of times these communities are disproportionately people who can't leave due to connections with being first responders, uh, whether they work for the local municipality, whether they are EMT workers, firefighters, et cetera. So I did my postdoctoral work at Florida A&M University. Shout out to FAMU, HBCU in Florida, obviously. And my work was funded. It was a grant that was funded by NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So with that being said, take a look at NOAA's, every year they come out with this billion dollar disaster map and take a look at these maps in recent years. These billion dollar disasters are not just coastal phenomena. You'll see many of these disasters, these billion plus dollar disasters happening in the the so-called heartlands or the flyover country. So when you think about how extreme weather is going to cause the middle of the country to pay a toll, it's not just a coastal, you know, an Atlantic coast or Pacific coast phenomena. Absolutely. And I think that one of the striking things to me about reading about your toxic mobility research is that it shows the intersection between climate justice and environmental justice issues as they pertain to hazardous waste sites, which are two of the biggest environmental justice topics. So could you speak a bit to how you see those two being intersected and going off each other? Yeah, not just intersections between climate justice, energy justice, and environmental justice. These are things 
Uh, you can't talk about environmental justice without realizing climate and energy components, just like you can't talk about environmental justice without talking about racial justice. So when we think about the most profound problems of the 21st century moving forward, the most remarkable problems are environmental challenges. They are going to be related to climate change, but you have to realize though that climate change problems are going to inform other environmental problems and environmental problems are going to inform climate change. So when you think about resource scarcity, typically may be seen as an environmental problem. Well, resource scarcity can create some alternative mechanisms for fueling our homes and that can cause a climate change problem. That's going to lead or bleed into public health problems. So when we think about disparities, I think it'd be very wise for us to think about coupling these things and not necessarily looking at them in a silo type fashion. And you've written a lot too about energy justice. And of course, these toxic waste sites originate from certain operations in a region. So we did an episode on natural gas compressors a while back and saw their disproportionately in environmental justice communities. And the same can be said for a lot of energy sources. So when we think about these plants getting shut down with the renewable energy transition, obviously that's a step in the right direction, but what needs to happen to be sure that these areas are also safe from the toxins that might be left behind from those operations? With any energy source, whether you're talking about fossil fuels, whether you're talking about renewable energy, we need to do a better job with life cycle analysis. We need to do a better job with social life cycle assessment and analysis. So when you're thinking about the facility that you just mentioned, we can't just design a facility and say, okay, well, it's giving energy to this number of households or this number of plants over X number of years. We have to think a little bit more holistically. So when we're talking about life cycle assessment, we need to be asking questions. Well, what is the imprint of that facility? What is the imprint of that technology from extraction all the way to retirement. And if you don't get that question in relation to retirement, right, then you don't have a very savvy or sophisticated way of understanding energy futures and energy use. In the same ways that we need to look at fossil fuels in this respect, we need to do that for renewable energy from cradle to grave, but we also need to start asking some questions about social life cycle assessments. Who are the workers who work in these facilities? When you think about retirement of a facility and where waste goes, well, who are going to be the workers responsible for retiring that waste? And are they disproportionately exposed to harm? And if they are, are they aware of that harm? Are they armed with proper equipment, et cetera? So like I said, when we're thinking about energy systems, let's make sure we're doing so in a comprehensive fashion. Just given how many factors go into them, it can be a little overwhelming to think what the next steps are and to improve these issues. So looking back to something like toxics mobility, what actions can be taken to improve the situation? If we're going to think about the hierarchy of how we address toxic mobilization, that hierarchy is going to start with communication and trust from stakeholders or in between stakeholders, governments, facility owners and operators. But even before that, we need to have a better prioritization of threat sites what sites are going to be most prone to flooding, what sites are going to be most prone to natural disasters, and those need to be at the apex of sites that are remediated. We need to think about what communities have acute vulnerabilities due to proximity to not just hazardous sites, but also proximity to climate change and extreme weather-related events. We need to think about how environmental justice populations are situated within these changing conditions. When you think about communities that have a Superfund site or brownfield, we know that these are environmental justice and or marginalized communities. So we need to put them at the front of the conversation for remediation. And then finally, we can never forget about what are the ramifications here for emergency responders. If we're expecting men and women to respond to hazardous events, we need to make sure that they're fully aware and that they're equipped with the appropriate equipment to make sure that they're safe when they're responding to emergency events of this nature. Dr. Turan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, my friend.
And before we go, we've got some more shoutouts this week. First, thank you so much to our newest patrons, Lisa Breland and Susan Cronin. We've got some great stuff in the works for our patrons. Once we hit 25, we'll start raffling off signed books from our experts to patrons. We got our first signed book last week, and another is in the mail. We've also got a really cool t-shirt and a really cool mug on there, so be sure to check all that out at patreon.com slash the sweaty penguin. Also, the other way you get a shout-out or get a second shout-out in the case of this next person is if you leave a five-star rating and a review on Apple or Podcast Addict if you're not on Apple. I've got an iPhone, so I don't have as easy access to all of you on Podcast Addict, but I'm keeping an eye on it, and I'll give you a shout-out if you drop us a review there as well. This week, we've got a review from Val3498EE. I'll give you a quick snippet of it, because it was a really, really nice review. The Sweaty Penguin will absolutely enchant you. So much of environmental media unintentionally turns into overwhelming jargon vortexes. The opening monologues of the Sweaty Penguin stand out by giving you a solid understanding of all the key parts packaged neatly into a hilarious, witty narrative. It's like taking a niche little knowledge pill while listening to stand-up. That absolutely made my day when I read it. Thank you so much. Adding those reviews really helps move the podcast up in the algorithm. So drop a review, help us out, and get your shout out on the show. Once again, The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from PBS flagship station, the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next week. Today's episode was written by Olivia Amate and Ethan Brown, edited by Frank Hernandez, and produced by Ethan Brown, Shannon Damiano, Frank Hernandez, and Caroline Kale. Our ads were voiced by Robert Branning, and our music was composed by Brett Saka. Special thanks to our Emperor Penguin patrons, Lawrence Harris and Brownie Central. Clips today came from New Jersey Spotlight News, PBS NewsHour, Dan Kurtz, Democracy Now!, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency.